Hello, everyone, and welcome to our class on the future of global economic issues, title which is Sustainable Environmental Policy and Global Politics. Our goal is nothing less than to try to grapple with one of the most important issues that are facing all of us here, not only in the United States, but also around the world. Uh, how do we know that? A couple reasons. First is that all of us sitting here in this classroom have just come from listening to Barack Obama give his inaugural address. In the middle of the inaugural address, he talked about the importance of global economic issues and the global environmental issues that are transforming the way we're thinking about the problems facing the world. So in his first minutes in office, literally, he framed the issues that we're going to be spending our time in this course talking about. If there's any doubt about that as well, all you have to do is look at the enormous international debate surrounding the question of environmental policy and global governance. Our goal for the course and our goal for these discussions is to try to explore these big issues, to try to think about what it is that we think ought to be done, and just as importantly, how to get it done. Is this a real problem? What's the source of the problem? Can we expect private markets on their own to resolve the problem, the degree to which there is one? And what role does government need, must government play in trying to sort these things out? So as we look through these puzzles, as we think about these questions, we'll be looking at those things in particular. This is an unusual enterprise here. It's an enterprise where we have this class here on our campus at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia. But we're also creating a forum where we're going to be sharing our ideas and our discussions with universities elsewhere in the world, in South Korea, in Japan, in China, and in Russia. And we're also going to be making this discussion available on the World Wide Web so that anyone who has an interest in joining this conversation will be able to take part in this conversation, to share your ideas, and to think about how we ought to, how we must address the issues of climate change, of the fundamental problems of governance, and how we're going to create a world that in the end is sustainable for all of us. So I want to begin by welcoming all of you, the students here in this class, as well as everyone joining us, wherever you may be, to a discussion that's focusing on some of the most important issues that we're facing. This is, I think, a, just a fascinating opportunity to try to build a large community to talk about one of these issues that, by any measure, is one of the most important that face us in our lifetime. What we've created online, and those of you here in the class will have a chance to see this shortly, those of you who are f watching this online already have found it, is the Global Environmental Sustainability Collaborative. And it's part of this partnership involving universities across the world with an effort to try to figure out how to attack these questions and how to try to resolve these big puzzles that we're facing. Uh, this collaborative is going to include video, like this lecture, blogging that the students here in this class are going to be leading an effort to try to create, but will be open to others around the world. Discussion forums where anybody who wants can join in. Discussion forums, a comment wall, very much like YouTube and other things that will allow collaboration among different people who are participating, as well as even a weekly poll of, of issues that will give people a chance to be able to weigh in and share their thoughts on some of the important issues that we face. The aim for the course and the aim for this collaborative is nothing less than to try to figure out what is it that, in terms of governmental policy, here in the United States and around the world, what should we do about trying to attack in the next round the issues of global climate change and the puzzles and problems that we face? The first round that everybody's heard about occurred in Kyoto back in the 1990s. The next round of climate change negotiations is going to occur in Copenhagen, Denmark, in December of this year. And as we gear up for that, the fundamental and the central question for this course is, what should the world's nations do when they meet in Copenhagen? What should the policies be? How should the government try to govern? What kind of broad international collaboration do we need? And perhaps most fundamentally, what is the relationship between citizens and their government in trying to advance these policies and programs? Uh, that's what makes this so exciting, because we're focusing on something that's real. And the findings of this collaborative are going to be presented at the World Civic Forum, which will be held in Seoul, Korea, in May 2009. The students in this class will be participating and will be contributing all of our ideas to that forum in May. And we're going to be working out electronically, looking forward to meeting with the other students electronically, 
who are also going to be participating in this and joining in an international collaborative to try to figure out what it is that we ought to do. So we're glad to have everybody who's in, in, enrolled in this effort, not only here in this classroom here in Philadelphia, but also around the world as well. Uh, what I'll try to do for each of these lectures is we'll be beginning each of our classes here in Philadelphia with a, a short lecture that I'll be presenting. Along the course of the semester, we'll have guest speakers from other countries who will be coming in and we'll be presenting other kind of material. But I'll try for my lectures to at least outline the major issues we're going to be talking about to, for the day. I'll try to go back then and summarize at the end to try to explain where it is that we've come and what we've accomplished, and then try to use that to frame the discussions for the next time as well. So for today, for the introductory session, there are really three big issues that I want to try to talk about. What we'll do is each point along the way is try to break up the lecture into different pieces because we're going to make it possible online to be able to zoom ahead to particular pieces of the things in particular that you want to do. And so these will be the, the kind of bookmarks as we work through the course and the lecture today. First, climate change. I put question marks because while in general there seems to be a fairly broad consensus on the reality of and the need for action to deal with climate change. Not everybody agrees with it. So what is it that we know about climate change? Is this, in fact, an issue that we need to deal with? Second question has to do with market incentives. Uh, is this something that, in fact, private markets can deal with on their own? And how, in fact, do private markets deal with issues of environmental policy and environmental governance? Should we, do we need to have a governmental role? And if so, how do we think about that? What is the governmental role in all of this? Which gets to the third question. If there's a need for governmental action, what is it that we know and how should we try to deal with it? So those are the three things that we want to deal with today. First, climate change. Is it real? Second, markets. Can markets on their own try to deal with these issues? And third, do we need governmental action in some way of some kind to try to deal with this? Those are the three things for today. The first point, then, has to deal with the climate change question itself. When the discussions start on climate change, two big things always come up. First, is it real? And second, if it's real, is it man-made? And the reason that that comes up is that first, if the answers are no, it's not real, and no, it's not man-made, then do we even need to worry about this at all? If the answer is yes, that it is real, and yes, that it is man-made, then the question is, what is it that we ought to do? Among environmentalists, for a long time, the answers to both of these have been pretty clear. Many environmental scientists, and increasingly now most environmental scientists, believe that yes, it's a real phenomenon, and yes, the lion's share of the problem is in fact man-made. But it's important to recognize that even today, not everybody agrees with that point. Not everybody agrees that there, in fact, is a major effort going on to, that ch it's transforming the climate, that, in fact, arguments about climate change suggest that maybe something's happening, but it's hard to tell how big or how real it is. And the reason why that's important is that any effort to try to deal with climate change is inevitably very expensive, very complex, ask people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, and therefore imposes real costs on everybody. So the puzzle is, before we go down this road, before we really try to deal with this big issue, do we really want to try to force everybody to make such big changes if we're not sure that it's real? Or put differently, how sure do we need, do we have to be, to ask people to engage in the kind of changes that, in fact, are going to be required to deal with the climate change issue if we decide to take it on. One of the things that really makes this difficult is that weather, climate, is incredibly varied. As all of us came to the building here today, it's a fairly chilly day for Philadelphia. Not unusual, but the temperature is about 29 or 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It's below freezing. With a little bit of wind coming up, it's a little chilly. And there are a lot of people who say, well, where's the global warming if everybody's so cold? I used to, in fact, live in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, they've had days where the high for the day never got above zero Fahrenheit, where I just saw a news bulletin this morning where 
The city set its all-time record snowfall for last year. The average snowfall in Madison is 40 inches. The previous all-time record snowfall was about 85 inches. Last year, they got well over 110 inches of snow. So the argument, the question that's often raised is, where's the global warming here? People are freezing and shoveling all this snow. Where's global warming? Is it, is it real? And on top of that, the argument that's also sometimes raised is, well, you know, there's tremendous variation in weather from year to year. You got hot years and cold years and hot days and cold days. How do you really know there's anything real and fundamental going on? How do you know that what you're looking at isn't just part of the natural cycles that go through the natural process of weather that happens all the time anyway? Is this any big deal? Two points. One is, we'll get back to the science on this in just a second. But the other piece that's important is that if it is real, and if climate does change, climate changes in a kind of pace that on a week by week, month by month, year by year basis, it's very hard for any of us to notice. You hear all these stories, well, when I was a kid, you know, we walked through unbelievable amounts of snow. And when you're little, the snow always seems bigger than in fact it is when you get larger. But just on an annual basis, it's very hard to be able to tell what the long-term trends are. One of the reasons why people put on weight over the years is that it comes on just an ounce or two at a time, and before you know it, you're a pound heavier and five pounds heavier and 10 pounds heavier, and all of a sudden you're looking at a serious weight problem, even though you never really saw it coming. And climate change issues are something like that. By the time you recognize that you've got a problem, the real problem is that it gets to be much, much, much harder to try to solve. And so aside from the questions about whether or not it's real, is the fact that it's hard to notice along the way. And if you wait until evidence is absolutely indisputable and irreversible, then at that point it gets to be either impossible or incredibly difficult to try to do anything about. So all the more reason to think pretty carefully about this to begin with. Recognize, though, that there are some people, substantial number of people out there, scientists and especially policymakers, who are not altogether convinced that what we're devoting the subject of the course to is worth our time and effort. What do scientists say? What is it that scientists say about this? And here's what some of the results show. Uh, what I'll try to do, by the way, as we go through these discussions is, if there's a question of fact or evidence, I'll try to put the citation down below. And this information comes from the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. And as you know, the Environmental Protection Agency over the last eight years of the Bush administration in particular has not been one of the big cheerleaders for major governmental policy change on issues of climate change and global warming. So this is, if you look at the, at the data, uh, probably from a source not inclined easily toward exaggerating the scale of climate change. What the EPA suggests is the following. First, that over the last century, the average temperature in the world has increased between 1.2 and 1.4 degrees. First question of that is, ah, big deal. Well, it's a big deal if you're this guy. And bit by bit, there's less and less ice to sand on. But in long-term climatological terms, a change in temperature of one degree over the course of a century is a fairly big deal, especially if what happens is that it's 1.2 to 1.4 degrees that occurs annually over long term and accumulates over a long period of time. If it's one and a half degrees or so per century and it get another degree and a half in the next century, another degree after that, pretty soon this accumulates to big times. Second thing, the eight warmest years on record have occurred since 1995. Third, Computer models suggest that an average increase of temperature in the 21st century is likely to be somewhere between 3.2 and 7.2 degrees. So the points are, and again, this is not from an agency that's known to be a big fan of the movement toward recognizing climate change. First, things have gotten warmer over the last century. Secondly, there seems to be a pace of acceleration the point that it was 1.2 to 1.4 degrees over the last century, and 
that in the next century, it'll be at a pace somewhere between uh, two and possibly four times that pace, so that things are accelerating. Now, so what do critics say about this? Well, they say that first, uh, we tend to put thermometers where people live, and the more people live, the more that the natural heat of people will tend to make the temperatures look like it's warming, when in fact nothing's really happening. You just have more thermometers where more people are. They tend to argue that cities themselves tend to hold heat, and if you put the thermometers where the people are holding heat, it doesn't mean the world itself is getting any, any warmer. Uh, in short, there are a lot of people who argue that still there's not much there. But what we have here from the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, and as we'll see later, from agencies around the world, is pretty clear evidence that something is happening out there. That in fact the world is on the whole getting warmer and that the pace of warming is accelerating. Why does that matter? The first point suggests the world is getting warmer, that something is happening out there. Secondly, it suggests that the pace of something happening is increasing, which leads to the third conclusion that the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be to try to do something about it. Recognize that gets back to the points that we talked about at the beginning, that if you wait too long to deal with something that's real, the longer you wait, the harder it gets. When we start talking about this, we tend to talk about this phenomenon that we call greenhouse gases. And for those who are watching this on the web, this slide will be indecipherable because it won't you won't be able to see it well. It's even hard in the room to be able to do it. But I have the source for the, for the slide down here below. And here's the point. What happens is that we have a collection of gases that people call greenhouse, greenhouse gases that create a greenhouse effect. Naturally, what tends to happen is that the sun's rays come down from the sun, and they hit the Earth, and then they radiate back up into space. And there's a kind of natural cooling effect as these rays tend to dissipate up through the atmosphere. Until, as it turns out, the Industrial Age came along, and from a whole variety of things that I'll go into shortly, the gases that were created as part of industrialization created a kind of umbrella over the Earth that held some of these gases in. So instead of having the sun's rays come down and radiating back into space, the sun's rays would come down and radiate back, but then be caught by this greenhouse layer. And here's an illustration of that. Uh, solar radiation passes through a clear atmosphere and back in the old days would have been bounced back. There's some information here about just how much of this goes back, but in general what we discover is that some of this comes down. Back in the old days, some, a lot of it would have gone back, but now increasingly some of it is absorbed in the greenhouse gas layer some of it's bounced back down to the earth, but what happens is that a lot of the heat that otherwise would have been dissipated through the atmosphere gets caught underneath it. How much? Well, it turns out enough to increase the average temperature of the earth by somewhere between one and one and a half degrees over the last century, and what climate scientists suggest will be an increasing rate over the next century as well. So here's the model. It has to do with these greenhouse gases that get caught in the atmosphere and that, as a result, tend to change the way in which the atmosphere deals with the radiation that comes in. Is this real? And again, this is the sort of thing that may be a little hard for those watching this on the Internet to see. Again, the source is down here. But here's the impact. What happens as these gases get caught is that bit by bit, ice tends to melt the ice in the polar ice cap and other kinds of places where, where stuff that gets cold tends to congeal. As it tends to melt, the sea level tends to rise. And what we've discovered is that, in general, we see an annual change of the sea level. And this is in centimeters. Centimeters are not large, but again, over time, bit by bit, we see from 1880 to 1980, over 100 years, a measurable and significant increase in the level of the sea. And then projections from 2000 to 2100 with different kinds of models and different kinds of assumptions that suggest that depending on which models you pay attention to, we either continue to see a significant 
but not huge increase in sea level to a significant and really big increase in sea level. Almost nobody really suggests that it's not real. Almost nobody suggests that the results are insignificant. The only real question is how bad do things get how fast? I'm just wondering how far back do these models go? I mean, I know obviously the Earth has been here for what, four and a half? Been around for a little while, four and a half billion years, years or so exactly. probably. So, I mean, obviously there have been huge shifts in ice ages. How is the science there to go back and determine the, the average temperature, I guess, average sea level going back hundreds of millions of years? Yeah, and it's, the, the question, I just want to check, the question comes through fairly clearly? Okay, that sounds good, because we want to make sure everybody can hear the question. Uh, how do we know this is a big deal over time? Because we know over time we've had ice ages. We know over time it's gotten really cold and then really warm because of cycles in all kinds of things having to do with climate. We also know that we haven't had thermometers around. We, we didn't have uh, cavemen holding thermometers outside their caves a couple hundred thousand years ago. So some of this is a little tricky. We've had good scientific measurements that are reasonably valid back to about 1880 or thereabouts. Depending on where you happen to live, we tend to have records that go back about that far. We require two things. One is temperature measuring instruments sophisticated enough and people who wrote them down. And before the 1880s, we didn't have either. Uh, Benjamin Franklin spent a lot of time paying attention to weather, paying attention to climate, paying attention to things, but there really wasn't a kind of systematic effort in lots of different kinds of places until the middle of the 19th century to have instruments good enough to measure and evidence that was good enough to be able to track trends. Uh, we, scientists have tried to deal with this problem a little bit by going back and looking at geological records. So you can tell what's tended to happen over time by drilling down and seeing what was happening in the, in the core of earth and stone. You can look and do the same kinds of things in, in ice formations, some of which have been around for a long, long time. You might wonder why would anybody want to go to the South Pole? And other than the fact to say that you've been there, it's not very much of a fun place. But you can take deep core samples and do other kinds of research there to get a sense of what's in the ice and how thick the ice was at different kinds of time. And so the scientists who have looked at that have concluded that as you look over time, there seemed to be something real going on. And that more importantly, as you look at these trends, that since we've been measuring some of this in a sophisticated way, that that also is important as well. What is, so what do scientists conclude? First, it's hard to say for sure with any kind of real certainty about what was going on before we started taking temperatures on a regular basis and writing them down, although the other scientific methods that have reinforced some of this. But the other piece of this that's important is that some, a large part of this phenomenon, especially the greenhouse gas argument, is because when humankind started the process of industrialization, as it started driving along on gasoline-powered cars, it started burning oil, it started burning coal, it started engaging manufacturing processes that emitted things, it started using more fertilizer, started doing other things that came along with industrialization, that that's when the greenhouse gases were being produced. The climate change scientists don't argue that there were greenhouse gases at the time of uh, 500 AD because nobody was engaging in processes that were creating greenhouse gases. What they argue is that as industrialization began, the industrialization process created these greenhouse gases. As the greenhouse gases began to be produced, that it began to trap heat into the atmosphere. As it began to trap heat under the atmosphere, the Earth began to warm. As the Earth began to warm, then things happened. So in a sense, the fact that we didn't have good temperature readings from 1750 across the world doesn't matter as much because we weren't doing the things that created the kind of climate change process. So good news and bad news, we don't have really good long-term temperature measurement. We have deep core drilling and other kinds of things, but we only have the temperature measuring from about the middle of the 19th century. But that's about the point where we started to engage in the activity that started creating the greenhouse gases. And what they discover is that about the time we started to create greenhouse gases, then things started to happen. 
A lot of this has to do with this sort of greenhouse gas argument. Why are they called greenhouse gases? Because they trap heat in the atmosphere. Just like a greenhouse traps heat, you have glass that allows the sunlight to come in, but then keeps the heat from dissipating. So you can grow tropical plants in frigid areas in the middle of the winter. That's what a, a greenhouse does with, gla with glass, and that's what these gases do in the earth. What are they? For the most part, these are all gases that are created through the process that came along with industrialization. When we started doing things with industry and the Industrial Revolution of the late 19th century, the following started happening. First, some of them are carbon dioxide. And what carbon dioxide comes from, which occurs naturally in the atmosphere, we're producing more of it by burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are fuels that come from decaying fossils, like oil in particular, and in some cases natural gas, where those things have, over the course of time, through geological processes, created things that turn out to burn pretty well and create a lot of heat. Turn to be pretty handy because you can transport them and you can use them to power your cars. And so cars in particular, as well as a lot of things that we use for heating and increasingly for cooling as well, tend to produce carbon dioxide. There's methane, where you produce and transport coal, natural gas, and oil. So that process puts out methane as well. Then there's nitrous oxide that occurs through agriculture activities. Fertilizer has, has a lot of nitrogen in it. And as we engage in a lot of agricultural production, some of this nitrogen and nitrous oxide ends up in the atmosphere. And then fluoridated gases are industrial processes. Used to be that we had lots and lots of spray cans that from spray deodorant to spray cleaners, you would hit the little nozzle at the top and there were chlorofluorocarbons on the inside that were there under pressure that had the oven cleaner or the deodorant come shooting out of the nozzle at the top. And for a long time, we used a lot of that until the concern was increased that this was increasing the problem with gas in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases. We don't do that anymore. It's very hard to find aerosols that work in that kind of way. But there still are a fair number of industrial processes that put out fluorinated gases as well. So the two things that are important about this greenhouse gas effect, one is understanding why it's called a greenhouse, because these gases tend to rise, get caught in high levels of the atmosphere, and as they get caught, tend to keep the heat in. And it's not just one gas, but many carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases that combine create this. Uh, good news and bad news. Good news is it's not just any one thing. The bad news is because it's not any one thing, there's no one single fix. It requires a very complicated set of responses to try to deal with this problem. And that's why, in many ways, things are more complex. Question then, ultimately, in terms of people who care about this, are they man-made? What's going on here, increasingly, is the problem of trying to figure out whether or not what's going on is something that man, him or herself, mankind, can try to deal with this. Ronald Reagan was out, in fact, on the campaign trail back in 1980, and he argued that uh, it was we had a lot of problems with pollution and that he said the trees naturally put out as they transpired doing what they do, what trees and plants do, putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And he said they were, trees were more responsible for pollution than industrial processes. So the next campaign stop, somebody came up, put a sign around the tree saying, cut me down before I kill again. So big laughs in the campaign trail. Reagan never really quite recovered from that, but they really got to the core of the question. Is the problem of these greenhouse gases, something that's a naturally occurring product of the way in which nature pays attention to what it does? Is it something that would have happened regardless if we just finally got good enough science to notice it? Or is it something that man it himself, mankind, ourselves, is in the process of doing? It's pretty clear that what's going on is that people themselves are responsible for a lot of this through transportation, 
we know and we've discovered that the very process of driving cars puts out gases at the back end of the tailpipe that increase the level of greenhouse gases. And we've discovered on top of that that there are other things from using powered lawnmowers and, and snow machines to even uh, barbecue grills that put out smoke, add to extra amount of gases in the atmosphere. Manufacturing processes are responsible for some of this as well. Not only the stuff that comes out of smokestacks, but just dust that tends to get blown away and the gases that they emit. Agriculture, as I suggested before, in terms of fertilizer, and even land use. It is true that trees put out carbon dioxide, but what they do is they process some of the stuff along the way. Uh, the more trees we cut down, the fewer trees there are out there to counteract some of the things that otherwise would be occurring through the natural cycle. Uh, we've deforested large parts of the rainforest in the Amazon. We've tended to crowd lots of people together, so we've tended to do some things that have cut down nature's ability to recover, and we've created large concentrations of things that increase the problem as well. So the answer, is it man-made? The answer is, yeah, a big part of it is. The scientists pretty generally agree. Not everybody, but there's general scientific agreement that it's real and that Human processes have produced this, and the large part of human processes that have produced it have occurred since the beginning and the dawn of the industrial era. And the projections, as I've suggested earlier, is that without fundamental change, it will continue and accelerate. One of the things that we have to recognize along the way as well is that everybody, there's a kind of counterargument that comes up saying, how can we be engaged in global warming it's really cold outside. Again, I have friends that live in the upper Midwest, and they're going through a winter now as bad as last winter was. It's even worse. My friend's back in Wisconsin right now. The average snowfall throughout an entire winter, which in Wisconsin starts in October and goes to April, goes on forever. The average high is 24 in January. They've had whole weeks where the temperature hasn't been above zero. The average snowfall is 40 inches. They're already at 55 inches in the middle of January. And they're not even halfway through the winter yet. People look at that and say, global warming? Who are you kidding? Where is the warming when I'm sitting here shoveling all the snow? Part of what goes on is overall, in the long term, a warming pattern. But in the shorter term is what some scientists have called global weirding. That is, not so much that everything always gets warm, but we have more extremes. We're more likely to have really cold winters followed by really warm summers. We're more likely to have more intense hurricanes. We're more likely to have fiercer tornadoes. That is, what's going on because of the accumulation of greenhouse gases is not only overall a long-term trend toward a warmer climate with our friend the polar bear back at the beginning, but also on a week-by-week, -week, month month-by-month, year-by-year basis, more extremes of weather. And so we're more likely, scientists predict, not only to see an overall long-term trend toward warmer temperatures, but also some winters when things are really awful, some summers where we have even more fierce hurricanes, so that we have more intense weather that comes along with it, what people call climate change, and in some ways, the reason for the debate and the battle between calling it global warming versus climate change is to get people away from thinking about this only as warmth and thinking it more in terms of variation. So what we have is stuff that turns out to be, in the eyes of most scientists, real, happening, happening because of human activity, significant, and occurring at an accelerating pace in ways that in the long term are likely to make the world warmer and in the short term likely to produce big extremes in weather conditions. So I'll stop here and we'll move in just a second to the second part of today's presentation. The second set of issues we want to turn to is the question of market incentives. Let's assume, even though not everybody agrees that this is real and man-made and something we need to do something about, but assume that we do. Assume that this is real, something we want to do something about. Why not just let the market straighten it out? 
Why not just allow markets through incentives, through different kinds of strategies to deal with this on its, on its own? And the reason, in a nutshell, is this. It's very hard for private markets on their own to try to deal with the issues of environmental issues and side effects because of two things. One is externalities, and the other is because of issues of time. On externalities, it's because the markets, as they exist, don't always encompass the ways in which the activities occur, because a lot of stuff goes out beyond the boundaries of what the markets can encompass on their own. And the other is that some of the stuff occurs over time in ways that markets don't very well capture. Let me deal with each of these questions in turn. The first externalities, just in terms of, of space. One of the things about markets is that you know, they work really, really well. And in theory, perfect markets with high levels of information, with large numbers of buyers and sellers in the long run tend to make everybody better off. That's the, the core of market competition. Now, that assumes that the markets, in fact, have large numbers of buyers and sellers, that the information is good, and that it has the ability to be able to capture all the effects back and forth. But in fact, the problem is that Markets are not very good at meeting all those conditions. And in particular, a couple of things that happen. Uh, one is that markets are often not very good about capturing the effects. Uh, one of the things that often happens is that for a long time, manufacturers discovered that if they had a, a nasty residue from the manufacturing process, it was easy if they were by a stream just to dump it in the stream and let somebody downstream clean it all up. People who lived upstream usually had much cleaner water than people who lived downstream because the people downstream ended up with all the junk that people upstream threw in it. Why would a company do such a thing? And the answer is, well, if you're out to maximize profits, it's a lot easier dealing with your problem by making it somebody else's problem, letting somebody else pay the cost to try to solve it, letting cities downstream figure out some way to be able to clean it up. And what happened with water pollution over time is that cities that were downstream had increasing difficulty in getting their drinking water out of some of these rivers because of the behavior of manufacturing plants living upstream. Philadelphia is a good case in point. The Schuylkill River, which runs through Philadelphia, is the source of our drinking water. Uh, one of the things that, uh, not to increase the sales of bottled water around here, but uh, the drinking, the stuff that we get out of the tap here in Philadelphia, comes out of the Schuylkill, and the stuff that goes into the Schuylkill further upstream for a long time created big problems for pollution. The problems weren't so much in Philadelphia, but both coal mines and other kinds of manufacturing plants way upstream that contributed pollution that then became Philadelphia's problem to clean up. When you have situations where private companies engage in behavior that creates problems that other people have to try to deal with, that's what economists call an externality. It's external to the market, external to the buying and the selling. If you're buying a say uh, everything from something to drink to a car that you're driving, and some of the costs of manufacturing that are exported by dumping the junk in the river, then you're not really paying the full cost of the car because somebody else has to pay for the cost of cleaning up the junk. Same is true of air pollution. Uh, once upon a time, uh, we were living outside New York, my wife and I, and uh, we were living in just a really nice suburb, had it train track going by the backyard, but other than that, it was fairly quiet. It was a residential area. There were some companies around, but the companies were all office buildings, and they weren't putting out any pollution. I noticed parking the car outside that after a while, there were splotches that appeared on the paint. I'm trying to figure out, how did that happen? Because not that we were religious about cleaning the car, but we would keep the, the car as clean as we could. And no matter how hard I rubbed the paint, the splotches would not come off. And it turned out, with a little bit of investigation, discovered that the problem came from manufacturing plants in the Ohio River Valley, hundreds of miles away, that would put pollution up into the air that would get blown east over our car in New York and come down out of the sky as rain. And so what was happening was that the raindrops were mixed with acid. And the acid was landing on top of our car and the acid was eating these holes in the paint, hundreds of miles from where it had occurred. About the same time in the mid-1970s, there were some really lovely fishing 
lakes and streams in Vermont, hundreds of miles from any manufacturing plants, where fish were floating dead to the surface. And they started investigating what was happening, what was killing the fish. And it turned out that it was the residue from the air and pollution produced out west, hundreds of miles away. Air pollution is not a problem as long as you live upwind. But if you're downwind of a plant that's putting out noxious stuff, you end up paying the cost of what it is that the plant itself and then its market doesn't fully capture. We have atmospheric effects above everything as well, and the stuff just goes up, where we're all paying the price for decisions that are being made everywhere. And interestingly enough, what's happening, and this is the argument for a global approach to pollution, is that if we're really interested <coughs> in dealing with the impacts of climate change, no one plant, no one city, no one country can deal with it, because if, for example, Korea or China or Canada or Denmark cleans up its facilities in terms of the impact of overall climate, it doesn't matter as long as other countries are out there creating the pollution that contributes to the greenhouse gases. So that if we're really interested in trying to deal with issues of climate change and greenhouse gases, we have the ultimate externality, where the market itself doesn't capture the full cost of the products that are being produced, because some of the cost of the products being produced is the impact on the climate, is the impact on pollution. So one of the problems with saying, just let the private sector take care of it by itself, is that the markets by themselves don't naturally capture the cost of the impacts of what they're doing. On top of that, there are also externalities that occur over time. This is not a criticism of markets, but simply to recognize that private markets simply operate in the long term to try to maximize profits in the short term. <coughs> Each year, what, what companies do is they report to the, sh to the shareholders about how much of the way of profits they've generated this year. <coughs> shareholders don't usually much appreciate an argument by a, a CEO that says, don't worry, um, profits aren't so good this year, but we're really trying to take care of the long-term greenhouse gas effects of what we're doing so that 75 years from now, we'll have an easier world to live in. Investors will say, that's fine, I'm glad, I'm proud of you, I'm going to put my money someplace else where I can get the returns that I need to try to deal with things now. Markets are not very good at recognizing the long-term effects of the costs and benefits of what's being produced because the nature of economic pressures is to balance short-term supply and demand. That's what markets are designed for, that's what they're great at, they're not very good at the long-term. What does that mean? What that means is that in the end, we end up by establishing the case for government action. If there's a problem that's real that we want to attack, and if private markets on their own are not very good naturally capturing these costs and benefits, what do we do? And the answer is we turn to the only other institution that's left, government, to try to do what it is that private markets on their own can't do for those things that we conclude have to be done. That's the end of the second part of the argument today about an assessment of the role of private markets in all of this. There's a kind of logic here establishing the case for government action. And the logic is, here's an important problem. We've got to address it. Private markets on their own can't. And so we have to turn to the institution that can, namely government. And by government, I mean some kind of collection of institutions that are responsible for the public interest, maybe local governments in the United States, state governments, and maybe a national government, and maybe some consortium of national governments around the world. And given the fact that we have problems that pay no attention to international boundary lines, we're increasingly going to these problems and questions of global governance, which gets to two big questions. First, in terms of strategy, nobody wants to just engage in governmental policy in addressing climate change just for the sake of doing it on its own. 
because we know that everything that we do is going to impose costs that otherwise industry wouldn't take on in itself. We also know that every time we impose a cost in industry that it wouldn't otherwise have taken on, it's going to hurt employment. It's going to cost jobs because jobs, in all likelihood, that would have gone to paying somebody to make something may have to be gone, may have to go instead to efforts to try to clean up the amount of pollution that's coming out. Side question about whether or not we're creating jobs in a different sector to try to make the economy more green, but it's just not an easy question about how much we ought to invest because there's a sense in the private sector that you tend to take away from companies in terms of their jobs and their profits when you increase the focus on reducing the amount of pollution. And the second is scale. Given the fact that by the very nature, the problems that we're dealing with don't pay any attention to boundaries, what kinds of strategies are most likely to fit the scale of the problems we're trying to deal with? And one of our big problems is we have difficulties in creating governmental institutions that really are at the right scale to deal with these problems. So let's deal with each of these questions. The first has to deal with government strategy. Just as it's the case that there's no one single source of pollution, no one single kind of greenhouse gas, there's no one single governmental strategy likely to attack the whole problem. Uh, this is both good news and bad news, as I suggested before. It's good news in the sense that it's not like there's any one thing that can and should be stopped in the minds of people on both sides, but it's also very complex because it means that if you're going to be successful, you have to devise a very broad and very sophisticated and very flexible toolkit. And the toolkit consists of everything from things that are relatively less intrusive in the market to things that are much more intrusive in the market. That is, there's a kind of continuum of activity. There are targets. This consists of kind of moral arguments and, gee, why don't we try to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases we're emitting? Then there is the voluntary labeling. Let's at least tell consumers how much energy they're consuming, try to educate consumers that less energy consumption is a good idea, and allow consumers to put pressure on manufacturers to do that. That has a big advantage because it's relatively inexpensive. And if you look at many, many products around the world, you see that more and more of them are either labeled as green or labeled as somehow environmentally friendly, or, as is the case here in the United States, you can't buy a refrigerator or a stove or a dishwasher or an air conditioner or a water heater or a furnace or a light bulb without getting a sense of how much energy they consume. And the idea is, well, let me see, if you have a fluorescent bulb that burns at the same brightness but consumes a lot less energy versus an incandescent bulb, why not pick the one that's more energy friendly? So the idea is to encourage consumers to create incentives for manufacturers to do things that are more green. Problem with that is, so far, we haven't produced the kind of savings on the scale that we need to try to deal with the problem at the level which scientists believe we need to act. There are incentives. One of the things that in the United States, for example, has been the case is that if you go out and buy a hybrid car or you buy a car that has good gas mileage, you get favorable tax treatment. On the other hand, there have been in the course of American policy things that are called gas guzzler taxes. Cars that use a lot more gas have to, you pay an extra tax to, just to be able to own them. So instead of telling people you can't go out and buy a car that guzzles gas, you just say if you do it, you're going to have to pay a lot more in terms of taxes and try to create incentives for doing that. So this way, you don't punish people for doing what they want to do, but you create economic incentives for them to change what they do. This is more intensive than getting, creating incentives, but at the same time, it creates stronger incentives through the markets for trying to get people to change their behavior. The problem again with this, does it work? Yes. Does it work well enough? Probably not. Which then allows people to say, well, let's use markets to try to find ways of, of dealing with the problem. And we'll be talking about this much more in the course of the semester. But in brief, the argument is, if we're trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases, there's some companies that find it relatively cheaper to do it compared to others. Some have manufacturing processes that are really hard to change, very expensive to change. 
if you make everybody hit the same targets, you're imposing much bigger burdens on some companies that have it more expensive than other companies that have it cheaper. So how are we going to deal with that problem? One of the arguments that's made is you can create a market where you can allow the companies that find it cheaper to reduce the amount of pollution to do so by allowing other companies to essentially buy and sell the right to pollute. On the Chicago Board of Trade right now, there is a market for sulfur dioxide emissions. And so there are caps on how much in the way of sulfur dioxide companies are allowed to emit. Companies that find it more expensive to meet that target can buy the right to pollute from other companies that find it cheaper. And so if you, can, if you want, you can go to the Chicago Board of Trade and find out at this moment what the cost to pollute is. And the argument here is that you set the target and you allow the market to figure out who can do it most cheaply. Because in, in terms of greenhouse gases, it doesn't matter if it's a company in Nebraska or a company in Illinois that reduces the amount of pollution. In terms of overall greenhouse gases, in the long run, the answer is probably no. Just to get the whole level down overall. And so whoever can do it most cheaply can, on the one hand, employ the most people, and on the other hand, produce the best target. And we'll talk more about this later, but the idea is let's find a way to make sure that in the long run, the market engages in some of this decision making instead of the government forcing. The long run, though, there's a basic worry that even all these things, no matter how well they work, will not work well enough without the government requiring changes to be made. What's the right answer? Uh, we'll get into this much later. And in fact, one of the projects for the course is for all of you to try to figure out how to engage this question to figure out what is it that we ought to do. But it's important to recognize we have a range of tools from things that amount to kind of moral targets to things that are requirements and everything in between. What should we do? Because there are no free lunches on this. There are no easy answers. Everything, including restrictions on companies' ability to act, has effects on how many employees can be hired to do the job. The trick is trying to figure out how to balance those things out. Then we get to questions of scale. And by scale, I mean whether or not this level at which governments act match the nature of the problems they're trying to solve. The whole argument for the Kyoto Protocols that were negotiated under the auspices of the UN back in the 1990s was an argument that individual local governments, state governments, even national governments could not adequately address the whole problem. Because what good would it do if Denmark uh, said, let's build a whole bunch of windmills and wind farms, which in fact they've done, so to reduce the amount of energy that they need to use. What good does it do if Iceland decides we're going to get all of our energy for heating water and for heating in the homes from deep geothermal, by because they're built on top of hot lava. They can, don't have to burn men, much of the way of fossil fuels except in cars because they have all this heat that's buried underneath. So in fact, if you want hot water in Iceland, you turn on the tap and hot water comes out because it's pumped in from geothermal wells outside the city. What good does it do for them to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions if other people are not? So what's the scale? And the biggest problem that we have, especially when we deal with greenhouse gas emissions, is that we really don't have institutions at the governmental level that match the scale of the problem. One of the problems about pollution, given the fact that there are externalities, is that just as it's the case that water that's polluted upstream from Philadelphia creates pollution problems in Philadelphia, and the cities upstream have little incentive to try to impose costs in their industries to reduce pollution in another community like Philadelphia downstream, just as it's the case that states that have manufacturing facilities in the Midwest have little incentive to impose restrictions on their companies just to try to save my car in New York from getting acid rain, the same is true that it's relatively, the relatively limited incentives for any individual country to impose costs on their companies if unless other companies around the world have to do the same thing. And right now, we don't have any way to try to force companies around the world to do some of this, except by engaging in international governance. So the challenge here is that if climate change is real, if climate change is because of greenhouse gases, 
if greenhouse gas is a problem that private companies on their own have a hard time trying to deal with, if that requires governmental action, but there's no government at the scale at which the problem needs to be solved, what do we do? And the answer is, we have this class. We have this forum because we have increasingly the need to try to figure out what to do with this. Kyoto Protocol, operated through the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, adopted in 1997, that's leading now to an effort to try to deal with this system with a meeting in Copenhagen that's going to occur in December of 2009. And I was going to show you a link to that, which I will do another time. But there's a countdown to the number of days, minutes, hours, and seconds to the climate change meeting in Copenhagen. There's that. You can see what the countdown is. The question is, what should happen in Copenhagen? What should we do? And the assignment for this class, for our collaborative with students and other universities around the rest of the world, and for all those who are taking part in this forum, is to try to figure out how to try to deal and address this question, how to try to deal with the problem that, in the end, we have an increasing sneaking suspicion we must deal with, we must solve, but where there are no easy, ready answers, but which, if we fail to act, we could end up waking up, maybe not in five years, maybe not in 10, but in 50 or 100, wishing that those students back in 2009 had been a whole lot smarter to try to figure out how to solve this problem. That is your job for this course. So the summary for today, and again, what I'll try to do each time is to summarize the points and then lead up to our discussion for next time. Uh, climate change, according to most scientists, is real and requires action. Without action, it's likely to get worse and, in fact, is likely to accelerate. The second point is that private markets don't naturally capture the environmental impacts of what they do. So relying on private markets on their own to try to act is increasingly a problem for trying to figure out how to solve these problems that we have governance systems, both national and international, that struggle to try to get traction over these issues. So the question for us all, those of us here, those of us joining us around the world, those of us joining us collaborative to try to discuss and explore this issue, is trying to figure out what kind of strategies make the most sense. To try to establish the background for this, what we're going to be doing next week is looking at the Kyoto Protocol. And on the syllabus is a whole collection of readings that are all easily clickable for you to be able to take a look at to be able to explore and answer the question of what is it we've done so far, what is it that we need to try to do, how are we going to get to where it is that we need to go. So that's the end of this week's presentation. Next week we'll pick up with the question of where it is we've tried to do so far.